We are here to talk to Dennis Young. Um, I'm Rebecca Hotman, and we're at the Corning Museum of Glass today. It's about 2 p.m. And Dennis, do you want to just uh, tell me your name and, and what you well, do? Well, my name is Dennis Young. And what do I do now? Sure. I'm a consultant uh, to the Corning Museum of Glass on um, right. visitor research. Um, and um, other than that, we travel a bit. And um, I enjoy gardening and building stone walls and things. Great. All right, so can you tell me um, when and where you were born? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts uh -huh. on, on January 15th, 1940. All right, so um, you uh, have, I've learned that you've been a designer for Corning Inc. Was that your first job? No, actually I, I um, started working for FCM Corporation, which okay. is Smith Corona typewriters okay. up in Syracuse. I um, worked there for four years and then in 1970 I came down to Corning. Mm -hmm. and uh, switch, you know, switch companies and began working for Corning. Okay, so what kind of educational training or you know, um, other kinds of uh, training pre preparation did you have to do sure. to become a designer? Well, it's, uh, what I did was a four-year degree uh, in the School of Engineering at the University of Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And it was a four-year degree in industrial design. Okay. Yeah. And basically, industrial design is a, is a combination of art and engineering mm -hmm. uh, so that you, you end up on a scale, depending upon how artistic you are or how engineering oriented you are, you end up on a scale between the two. Um, but most industrial designers are aesthetically sensitive mm -hmm. um, and um, some are more engineering oriented than others. Okay. So you, um, at Smith Corona, did you work on typewriters, designing typewriters? I designed some, um, some of the uh, nameplates for typewriters. Okay. Actually, I did, I did a concept typewriter for them um, just before I left. Oh, cool. Uh, I also worked for one of their divisions, which was um, um, Proctor Silex. I designed mm -hmm. a, a blender for them. Okay. And that ended up in an exhibit on the uh, Smithsonian Institution. I was quite surprised. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Annual design award on that. So I was going to ask, <coughs> excuse me, ask you how you got into glass, and I'm assuming maybe the blender was the first piece of glass that you No, actually on? the bowl for the blender was plastic. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, um, how I got into glass was I came down to Corning to help them uh, or to design their uh, line of small appliances at that time. Okay. And uh, when I came down after about two months of work on that, that group was disbanded, mm -hmm. and I was moved over into the consumer products of the cookware group. Okay. Which at first I wasn't particularly interested in, um, but they kept making the projects become more and more interesting. Uh -huh. And then they started a line of small appliances, which was uh, good. That really didn't go anywhere. Um, I worked on the um, uh, coffee percolator, okay. uh, the E1210, I think it was called. Okay. And uh, that was a redo of the P90, which was the um, original uh, percolator. And um, then a number of just uh, incidental products, baking dishes and pie plates and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end of my tenure in the design department, um, I was given, I, you know, the, the, um, the project, the measuring cup project ended right. on, on my desk. I won't say it was really mine. I didn't invent it, but it happened. And I was at the right place at the right time for uh -huh. that. So leading up to that, um, <coughs> you said you designed a couple different kinds of appliances and plates. Um, mm -hmm. What was involved in the design process for that sort of thing? Well, in the design process, it really starts with a marketing need. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was one of the things I think that the Corning designers uh, were very um, well briefed on what the market was and what the market needed. And uh, they even would sit in on uh, market research discussions when, the, mm -hmm. uh, do, uh, when there were focus groups. And they would sit behind the well, one-way mirror right. and listen to consumers talk about their product or a, a product in their category. Um, and I found it very valuable as a designer to hear the consumers talk about that. So um, that was one thing we were involved with market research. But the, the whole process really starts with, with uh, sort of coming up with ideas as to what the product might be, you mm -hmm. know, what are the various options for this product, considering the marketing, the marketing needs, the financial needs, uh, engineering re and market and manufacturing requirements. Uh, all of that has to come together on your drawing board. Right, <laughs> right. And so you have to be knowledgeable <laughs> in what, um, you know, how glass flows within a mold, uh, and what you can do and what you can't do with glass. Mm -hmm. um, so you come up with various options and you. Actually, in that time, as designers, we had a very extensive model shop. We would go into the model shop 
and build a non-glass model. Okay. Uh, sometimes it would be plaster, sometimes it would be wood. Uh, it, if it were like Corningware, it could be painted white and made to look like Corningware. Uh, with Pyrex models, um, we developed a very, uh, what I thought was pretty sophisticated, uh, clear casting of epoxy. So we'd mm -hmm. have a clear epoxy casting of our design. Okay. Um, we'd make a, a wooden uh, master and then molds and then cast into the molds with a clear epoxy. And so you could actually make a product that was, they would use in, in the photo, uh, photograph okay. for the, for the uh, catalog. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was that good. You know, it looked <laughs> like the actual, wow. I actually had some of the... Um, Custard cups I worked on one time, uh, they were for Fireside, the color of Fireside glass, mm -hmm. and um, they were painted uh, to look like Fireside, and the photographer photographed them up in Rochester, and when he was done with them, he just gave them to his relatives. And of course, the first time they put it in the dishwasher, all the paint came oh. off, and they sent it back with a very <laughs> angry note about the fact the color had come off their Fireside <laughs> custard cups. So we explained to them what had happened. Right. <laughs> so but that's just the sort of thing you run into. Mm -hmm. So um, you said you worked with all sorts of different models and molds. Now, mm -hmm. did those have to go through? Would you create a model and then it would? Yes, it, then it would be a, a, appraised by the consumer. Okay. Uh, yeah, we take it out and do uh, focus groups or do uh, comparative testing where mm -hmm. people would vote on it. Uh, the focus groups would really tell you. The way that worked was um, there would be a group of consumers and you would start them talking about the, um, the product category mm -hmm. and what they liked and disliked about the current products that are on the market. And then you would introduce uh, this proposed product. And you might mm -hmm. introduce, in, in, introduce it in a, a competitive array, too, and, and introduce some of the competitive products with yours in there. Right. And then you'd see what the consumers said about it. And um, if we were lucky, they liked it. And if we, <laughs> if we weren't lucky, they didn't. <laughs> um, I know with the... Um, Oh, the small appliance I was working on, the Mr. Coffee. You know, remember okay. the Mr. Coffee line? It was a line yeah. of, of drip coffee makers. That was a major change for the American market to switch from percolators to drip coffee back in the early 70s. And um, the original Mr. Coffee came out, and it was a fairly ugly, white, boxy thing. And we, had, we wanted to come up with some better-looking designs. But mm -hmm. by that time, Mr. Coffee had established the aesthetic for what a drip coffee maker, electric drip coffee maker, right. should look like. And so even though we had some what I thought were award-winning designs, um, we just couldn't beat Mr. Coffee until we, oh. we did finally got, come up with one that we went with. But I think the whole product line was canceled before it went to market. So was that tough when you would go through all of the work to design and test and design and test a product mm -hmm. and then it was just kind of axed or didn't do so well? Well, it, yeah, it was tough. It was not only tough for your ego as a designer, but it was tough on your career. Yeah. <laughs> So you very quickly learned what, what worked and didn't work, and also what, uh, you know, when the consumers said they wanted this or that, mm -hmm. you could do that. And um, so it was, uh, it was a, and there again, the artist in you wanted to do what you wanted to do, but really you needed right. to do what the manufacturing process required, what the marketing people wanted, what the uh, consumers wanted, you know, and what the financial people could, you know, pay for. <laughs> so there were a lot of things that you had to consider and work into the design. So when it came out, it wasn't, just your design. Mm -hmm. It was a, really a team effort from a lot of different people. Right. So now testing, you mentioned um, how you got the groups together. Now would this be, did you just do U.S. testing? Did you test internationally? Did you test in different regions of the country? Um, the testing was done across, usually across the country, like you might go down to Philadelphia and to do mm -hmm. two focus groups in one night in Philadelphia then fly out to the West Coast, either Los Angeles or San Francisco, or to Phoenix or to Denver. You know, just, you'd, you'd try and mix the country. Well, usually right. when we did, sometimes we'd do four, and you'd do actually four in the corner. You'd go to LA, Boston, Florida, and um, San Francisco or something mm -hmm. like that. And you'd do uh, focus groups. And what was interesting is the first couple of groups, you really had no idea what you were hearing. You didn't know whether it was relevant or not. Right. By the time you got to the end, if you did four or six groups, there was a lot of continuity in huh. what they were saying. And so was there wasn't necessarily that much difference between areas of the country and how they would in respond? In most products, there weren't, no, okay. no. Interesting. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that as part of your job designing glass, you had to know the properties of glass and what would and wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Did you get any special training in that sort of thing? Um, no, it just sort of training on the job. Okay. You got feedback from the manufacturing engineers as to what you could do. You come up with a design that's <laughs> <laughs> that you could, you could possibly make that, uh -huh. and so yeah, and they would tell you why, and they were very. I mean, they were, they they, they weren't really 
uh, beating you up on it. They right. were just saying, no, <laughs> the glass won't do that. Mm -hmm. And so very quickly you learn what glass will do and what glass won't do. It's, it, this is, um, I was thinking about this before uh, I came here today, and it's really quite something when you have a, a gob of molten glass mm -hmm. drop into a mold, and then that mold closes. One of the requirements was that the, all of the glass reached the perimeter of the mold at the same time. Okay. Because if some of it's still unfilled when it closes, that's a gap. Huh. If you have extra glass someplace, that's going to flow out before the mold closes and become rather, you know, flash, right. which you'll all have to cut off. And so it's really quite an art to uh, get the right size gob for mm -hmm. the uh, mold that you have. And also, say something like as complicated as, say, a skillet, where you have this bowl of the skillet and then a handle. Mm -hmm. That glass has to get to the end of the handle the same time the glass gets to the rim wow. on the other side. So you have to design the mold so that the glass moves faster mm -hmm. in that direction and goes out through the handle. And then when the whole thing closes down, it's all filled. Right. And um, that's, yeah, it is. And so you, you spend a lot, I remember this would be Dick Greger and the um, Visions skillet, mm -hmm. uh, really spent a lot of time on the handle design because he wanted to make sure that the glass flowed all the way out to the end of the handle. Um, what, what glass would like to have is a constantly decreasing uh, mm. opening so that it's constantly being contained and forced right. out into the end. Well, if you think of a skillet handle that tapers backwards, It'd be very hard. It would be very slippery to hold. You'd be right. just sliding right off it. So what what Dick did uh, was design it so that it was vertical in the front, very and a lot of area in the front, mm -hmm. but it was narrow. And then as it got wider, it would get thinner at the top. So oh. the glass was always constricting. Okay. But the handle was actually wider at the back than the front. That is really smart. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was very clever, I think, and it was very good. And so when when I got time to do the measuring cup, I mm -hmm. I didn't have to have that restriction. I could just keep it tapering all the way to the end. Right. But I did have to get it all the way out to the end of the handle Right. Uh, uh, quite by the distance. time the mold closed around the other side. So. Wow. So did you actually design, um, the, you designed the piece, but then did you design the mold that they would? Well, no. <laughs> the, what uh, would happen is I would design the object. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, and by the way, I was, a, I was a shape designer. Okay. There were also decoration designers who oh. were much more artistic. Remember I talked about that artistic right. scale, um, engineering to art. They were much more artistic. They were more illustrators, and mm -hmm. they would design the decorations to go on Corel and to go on okay. Corningware, and in some cases on Pyrex. But most often, it was the uh, the opaque material. So um, I would design the shape. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I would hand that off to engineering, who would do a, a detailed engineering drawing of it, mm -hmm. just making sure that it was dimensioned uh, correctly for the other people. Then we go into the mold shop where they would cut the molds, and that's a huge um, general machine shop down here. Okay. On, um, I forget the name of the road, but right here yeah. in Corning, it was um, uh, a huge machine shop, and they would cut the molds um, for okay. for the glass. And think also that the way glass production glass is made is it's big, huge table, mm -hmm. and you have I think uh, eight or ten or twelve mold sets around the table for the base. Uh -huh. You have one plunger, uh, so you have to make um, twelve molds all exactly okay. the same. And then you have to have backup molds for them. Right. So the right. machine shop, once you said, you know, once you design a product, they're making molds like crazy down there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then they have the backup molds too. And while we're on the subject of molds, and talking about the measuring cup that I was involved yeah. with, um, the original measuring cup that was designed in 1938 or 9, I mm -hmm. think, um, had a five piece mold. Okay. There was a base to it, which was just the little round base, then two um, clamshell sides that would come in and then there would be a plunger and a ring so okay. it was a five piece mold and there was that hinging operation so it had to have some sort of a, a mechanism to open and close the mold that way right. um, so it was a very complicated mold compared to just a regular pressing mold right um, and every time it went into production in main plant they said that the whole plant was on call <laughs> oh. because they wanted to keep that in production remember there were 12 of them around the table right. all of them opening and shut and they said that the mold shop was kept busy by maintaining the molds because the right. mold the thermal shock of the mold would wear them out fairly quickly and they were always working on 
you know, making sure that they would, the measuring cup would stay in production, you know, mm -hmm. that they had a full set of molds to of work course, on. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so it was very complicated, and that's, um, that was one of the improvements that we made with the measuring cup. Right. Well, and um, I know with your measuring cup, the handle is detached at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, with the uh, earlier measuring cups, it was attached on both sides. Was mm -hmm. that a separate piece that was added on, or that was no, part of the mold No, that as was well? part of the mold. Okay. And what the glass would do there, remember we talked about the glass flowing mm -hmm. into it, the right. glass would flow both from the bottom and the top into the handle. Oh, okay. And where that knitted was, it, it told them how, how liquid the glass was. Right. Because sometimes the glass would come together down at the bottom, sometimes it would come at the top, but they wanted it to come at a certain point okay. and join and not, be, and not show a seam there. So it still had to be warm right. enough to really come and join together. So now if it did <coughs> show a seam or, or meet too far at the bottom or the top, would that be a defective product? It depends on the structure of it, okay. yeah. It, it could well be. Uh, certainly if it didn't come together, you know, right. and I saw some of those where it didn't come together or, huh. or, or there was a, a, an obvious joint. But yeah, if you look closely on, on the older measuring cups, you can, you can see that joint. Interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned um, uh, you did the shapes and someone else added uh, decoration. The, the decoration. Mm -hmm. Um, now, for the Pyrex measuring cup that you designed, was that something that, that design, the decoration was pretty Actually, standard? Actually, I, I, did, I did, yes, because really it was just measure marks. Right. It was right. The measure, both metric and customary measure marks, and then the word Pyrex up mm -hmm. at the top. So I, I laid out the graphics for that, and I actually <clears throat> I redesigned the word Pyrex a little, oh. a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit, uh, to make it fit. Uh -huh. so. Well, that, so let's so, talk about the measuring cup. Okay. Um, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So you designed the Pyrex measuring cup for the year 1983? Um, actually, the project may have started in 84, 80, 84. I think I finished in 86. Okay. So how, um, how did the project come to you? Um, it came to me, well, a couple of things. Um, the main plant was getting old. Mm -hmm. It was one of the oldest plants in the in the company right. in terms of pressing glass. Um, they were looking around, top management was looking around for a location for the headquarters. And so they, um, they thought that maybe closing down main plant and building the headquarters in Corning, or mm -hmm. across the river there, was what they wanted to do. And that was okay. They could relocate all of the products in main plant to other plants, mm -hmm. except for the measuring cup. <laughs> The measuring cup, none of the other plants wanted because it was so <laughs> difficult to make. And I, I think in a way they weren't even set up to do right. that sort of thing. So um, what to do with the measuring cup was the, was the problem. You know, how do we do that? And luckily, what had, what had come along the way was that as they were making visions, the clear pyroceram okay. um, products down in Martinsburg, they had a saucepan, which was a, like a four-quart or, you know, or two-quart saucepan. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, excuse me, two cup saucepan with a handle out the side. Remember I talked about Dick Gregor designing right, the handle yeah. so they'd be wider at the back. Uh, and every now and then when that would go through the heat treating, what was necessary to make it a, a, power, a ceramic, mm -hmm. a glass ceramic, a little bit too much heat and the handle would sag down. And so someone looked at that and they said, and it wasn't me, but someone looked at it and they said, that looks like a measuring cup. <laughs> <laughs> so that gave us the answer as to how to make a product, how to design a product uh. that could be made in other plants other than the main plant with this open and shut mold, mm -hmm. very complicated one. So um, the, that was the theory. Um, I think what, happened, what actually happened was that Jerry Galata, who is a consultant designer to Consumer Products Division, designed a big batter bowl, which was a, a eight cup bowl with a handle that mm -hmm. sagged down. And then, the, then I got the measuring cups to do, uh, I actually was the sort of the de, um, in, inside designer for Jerry Galata okay. on, the, on the batter bowl. So then the measuring cups were the next step. <coughs> and I designed them um, or redesigned them uh, for this new process with a handle that comes out and then it sags down. It was mm -hmm. secondarily heat treated. It's molded with a handle out flat. Okay. And then, uh, then it's heat treated and the handle sags down right. around a form, so it's always the same shape. Huh. Um, and what I did was I built some, um, some wooden models in our model shop, and I snuck them into a, um, a focus group that we were doing out at the mall. It was a very casual focus group on something that wasn't very, you know, didn't need national testing. Right. And, but I just I took it out of the box and put it on the table and said, what do you think of this? <laughs> and they said, oh, there's a measuring cup. Yeah, that's really neat because you could, you could stack them up. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and they were just wooden and they were all painted gray, but people understood it. 
So I said, okay. So I went ahead and I made, oh, they went into hand shop trials in Maine plant based okay. on, the, on the designs that I came up with. They did hand shop trials of the, um, of the one cup. Now what's a hand shop trial? A hand shop trials are they make one mold. Okay. And uh, they actually almost make it, well, they may make it an open shut mold, excuse me, a, a regular press mold like this. And they make one mold and they hand drop a gob in there and then okay. press it down with a big make man right. manual thing. Um, and they uh, made a, like 10 of them. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we took that out to uh, another, um, um, actually, yeah, we took that out to a focus group. And again, people were very, fa very positive about it. Then we took it, we made up some real finished products. Uh, we did with these hand shop trials, we made some more, put graphics on them. Uh, so we now had glass products that looked mm -hmm. like production products. Uh, we took them into our test kitchen. Okay. And uh, we set up some stations in the test kitchen for people to actually use both the uh, current measuring cup and the new or proposed measuring cup. And we had those stations set up and as people came into the test kitchen, this was really, it was, it was so gratifying as a designer because they would come into the test kitchen, take their coat off, look at the setup, walk over to the new cup and say, can I buy this? Oh. Where, where, can I get this in the wow. company store? <laughs> <laughs> and so we almost didn't have to do the, you know, the trials and right. everything else. But we had them make various things to make sauces, to make puddings, to measure things and compare the two. And then we had them do repetitive tests, mm -hmm. you know, um, like filling it with boiling water and then pouring the boiling water okay. again and again to see if their wrist got tired. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in all cases, they preferred the new measuring cup. Really? So we knew we had a winner. <clears throat> And um, um, I guess when it went to market the first year, it sold 150% um, of what the old measuring cup had sold. Oh <laughs> <laughs> so we did have a winner. And it, it took, um, you know, the, it got a lot of industry press and things like that. That's amazing. And uh, whereas the original measuring cup was made in 1938 or 9 mm -hmm. uh, to 86, which is almost 50 years. Mm -hmm good run for a product. Right. Um, mine is still running. Um, it's, uh, but it's, um, and I'm what, about 20, 25 years now. I, yeah. I'd have to do the math, but <laughs> I'm on my way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, they've come out with a new uh, four cup measure, okay. which I think is very clever. It's what they're recognizing is that because of the clear glass, a lot of people, they look down into the measuring cup and they, they fill uh. up by looking through the glass. Yep. So they printed the numbers in reverse. <laughs> they printed the numbers in reverse. So you actually are, are and they made it much more conical oh. or uh, more flared so that you can look through the wall and see it very, I think that's, ah. I think they're really recognizing human behavior when they do that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I look in and then I put it on the table and look on the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's one way of doing it. And then uh -huh. there's the right and left thing is the yeah. graphics on the right side. Uh, we put metric on one side, customary on the other. And in the States, we put customary on the, the left side of the cup. So you'd be holding right. it in your right hand. So the lefties. But the lefties, <laughs> or, or a lot of people hold it in the left, they pour with the right. Oh, okay. So they wrote us and they said, it's on the wrong side. Now, we had a very easy solution to that because in Canada, for the Canadian measuring mm -hmm. cups, we printed the, the graphics in reverse. Okay. So we just sent them a Canadian cup <laughs> and they would be happy. So whatever, whatever their preference, we had an answer for it. That's great. The, um, one other criticism of it was that the, there was so much headroom in the one cup, mm -hmm. there was almost, you could almost fit two cups of liquid in it, and the okay. graphics stopped about three quarters of the way up. That was very deliberate uh, because at the time, people were, were still learning how to use a microwave oven. Mm -hmm. And if they put a milk based product into a measuring cup and heated it, it would foam up. Right. And they needed the headspace for that foaming. Um, but a lot of people just thought it was extra space that they didn't need. So they, they wrote us in a lot of notes about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. <coughs> I hadn't even thought about that the microwave was new enough that you were still having mm -hmm. to, to work in with that. In the 80s, it, you know, it was fairly well distributed by that. When I first came in the 70s, it was mm -hmm. the radar range, you know, it was very, it was, uh, very and, and it was really bizarre because it was a different way of thinking about cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were actually heating the food, not the object that the food right. was in. Um, but in the 80s, there was still that concern. Not, not everyone had a microwave or really mm -hmm. understood it. So. so did that affect the design for all, all the products you worked on? You would have to think, you know, if this is in an oven or if it's in a microwave, how do I if have to... For the larger items, no, it really okay. didn't. Uh, you, you know, the headspace wasn't that big a deal. For mm -hmm. a one cup measure, though, uh, the headspace was critical. If, if, okay. if it boiled over, it would boil over very fast and dramatically. Right. 
Now, did the handles or the thickness of the glass have to change because of that? Because of the microwave? Right. Uh, no, no, a the, that type of Pyrex at that time was totally transparent to microwave. Okay. So it didn't, it didn't get hot and didn't um, heat up. Right. Um, the length of the handle was another thing. Um, with the two cup and the four cup measures, they, got, they could get enough glass out into the handle mm -hmm. to make it for their full hand. With the one cup, for my hand, it only covered, uh, the handle only came down to about, right. about three fingers. Right. And the, the, the pinky was hanging out there. I tried to get them to make it longer, but they said the glass just wouldn't go out that ah. far, you know, considering the size of the handle. Right. So. Right. Interesting. But, but I don't think we got too many complaints about that. People just seem to understand that. A lot of people grab it, they grab the cup and have the handle go over the back of the hand. Oh. Because it's, you know, it's right. almost as easy to hold it that way as it is to hold the handle. Right. Unless there's something really hot in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You wouldn't do it with something really hot. But. So what kind of comments did you get, um, like in the, t in the test kitchen or in the initial feedback? Mm -hmm. um, did it, was it mostly, was the biggest difference the handle or did they notice other things that they liked or didn't like? The biggest difference was the handle definitely because it was an open handle. And right. they could, what the open handle meant was that you could now nest the product one in uh, the smaller right. one in, next smaller next smaller and, and it only took a space about this far this mm -hmm. much with the previous ones the ones that had been in production for 50 years it it was like stacking coffee cups it right. would go up and go <laughs> off at an angle and so what we found in research was that people would store them in different places in the kitchen they wouldn't store them all together they'd store the one cup in the cabinet or in the drawer mm -hmm. they'd store the two cup in the cabinet the four cup went down below okay. because it was so big, and, and they, right. they just and they couldn't they couldn't put them together, so they didn't. They sprinkled them all over the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the with the design that I had with the open handle, they were able to nest and fit into a much smaller space, and they they were stored together. Right. So you said um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that you started working on this pro on the measuring cup project, and it took a couple years. Now, were you spending all of your time working on that, or did you have a you know, a couple different projects going there, on? There might have been other projects going on. Okay. Uh, at the time, I was right on the verge of transitioning from design into um, what was going to be a market and market research mm -hmm. career. Um, uh, that's one of the neat things about Corning is it allowed me, they allowed me to, to switch careers at age 46. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I moved from design into a full marketing position, which I really didn't feel comfortable in. Okay. I felt I was, um, I really had been spending a lot of time studying the market research, pr the focus group process, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do focus groups. So I um, proposed to um, Vivian Grenan, who was making, they were, they were forming a corporate marketing group. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, look, I can, I can do this, I can do market research as, a, you know, like a consultant within the company. Right. And they said, fine, that's, that's what we're going to do is we're going to build a group of skilled people, um, you know, senior people who have these skills, mm -hmm. and they will be a corporate marketing consulting group for the rest of the corporation. Okay. So I ended up, um, the last 10 years of my career, I was providing market research services uh, to a variety of divisions and uh -huh. groups within the company. Interesting. Uh, and sometimes like um, corporate travel wanted to find out how well they were doing in terms of scheduling flights and, and providing mm -hmm. services to all the people who travel in the company. Um, a number of other, I'm trying to think, oh, there was one, <laughs> one um, research project I did for, it was corporate communications. They, they wanted people to read the insurance <laughs> uh, booklet that they were coming out yeah. with to see if people understood it. Mm -hmm. And um, that was not one of the more exciting <laughs> research groups that I did. <laughs> but they, they'd sit there and read this thing and then tell me whether they understood right. it or not. So, so the market so. research uh, in this case was mostly doing things internally, wasn't No, it was products? some external, um, a, a number of external things. I worked for the lab group uh, testing um, pipettes and beakers and things like that that okay. they were thinking of coming out with. Uh, one of my last projects was for the um, uh, fiber optics mm -hmm. where they were talking about um, they wanted to learn from the marketplace if there were, in fact, um, categories hmm. of, of customers in the fiber optic market. Okay. And uh, what we found was there were tiny little pockets and not very many, you know, you really couldn't categorize or segment the market the way mm -hmm. they wanted to. There weren't, weren't like four big segments. There right. were many little segments. Um, but also in that, in that, 
discussion series, and that we did really we did six of them all across the country. Um, we were asking about well, we had already in in fiber we had already done across the country and under the oceans, and then we had done from major towns, you know, what we were and and within the towns what we wanted to get into was what they called the last 50 feet. Okay. From the road to the computer, or from the from the um, um, electronics closet to the computer on your desk, mm -hmm. the last 50 feet. And actually, that was the biggest market of all of them. The the long term, the long distance markets weren't a big market, but the uh, the last 50 feet was the big market. And we were so we were talking about what it would take to um, what what a fiber product would need to have, what characteristics would it need to have. Uh, to go this last 50 feet to the desk. Mm -hmm. And in one group, one person said to me, he said, well, you realize the last 50 feet is going to be wireless. Uh. And I said, <laughs> wow, if, mm, if, it, you know, if it's going to be wireless, that means there's not much of a market for Courtney. <laughs> I took it back to the product manager, and I, I mentioned this one. I said, there was one person in one group who mentioned this. And um, he said, oh, <laughs> no, it'll never work. You know, that, that, uh, it'll never be wireless. What do you mean? So we, just, we kept on looking for segments for the fiber optic, but it was interesting to see you know, how it developed. You know, right. Way back, that was back in the, um, the mid-90s mm -hmm. that they were talking wireless. Huh. And that's what's come to pass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wireless. <laughs> One smart person. One smart, well, that's, and that's why you do focus groups. And that's right. why, as, a, as a focus group moderator, I often tell my client that sometimes it's just one person yeah. that has the wisdom, and that's what you're listening for. Um, yeah, you, you, in fact, when you're doing focus group research, you, you very seldom report back that 30% of the people said this, because they right. are not projectable. Focus groups are not projectable. Surveys are projectable, mm -hmm. but focus groups are just sort of these, this market insight. Huh. And sometimes it's only one person who really tells you what's going on. Right, right. So, so um, you worked mainly in design and then you worked in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, you did different daily tasks, um, but was um, kind of the culture or the atmosphere different working in those two different areas? That makes well, sense. yes, it does. In fact, um, as a staff designer, mm -hmm. I was assigned projects. Okay. My boss, you know, there'd be projects would come in, and my boss would hand them out to various people in the department. Say, and I was, I got most of the project, the Pyrex ones at that time, um, and you were sort of, and then you were obligated to work to a schedule with mm -hmm. everyone else and all of that. When I became, when I moved into marketing, and became a consultant to the corporation, uh, they would ask me. How much time do I have? Am I that uh -huh. busy? <laughs> so, so I could very much schedule my own time, and, and I was really in business for myself within the company. Mm. And that's a wonderful way to work. I it just it was like a weight off my back, and I was I was really in charge of everything that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and my clients, of course, would would ask me to do certain things, and I'd decide how to do it and how not to. But anyhow, it would it was a totally different. Um, atmosphere right. working for myself and I at the time I was saying gee I wonder how you could turn almost every job in the company to being in, in business for yourself mm -hmm. within the company it would be neat if like an administrative assistant could <laughs> consider herself his himself or herself in business for themselves right it's a wonderful situation and what was nice was if I had a good year and I sold a lot of market research services that was good if I had a bad year I still got paid the same amount so okay. that I didn't have that that sort of axe hanging over me of, right. of I've got to make sales. Um, so that was a nice way to learn about how to get started in the consulting business. Right, definitely. Um, so what year did you start working for Corning? 1970. 1970, and mm -hmm. you retired in? 1998. 1998. And I transitioned into marketing about 1986, okay. 1987. So you mm -hmm. worked there for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. um, now, I asked about the differences between the two areas that you worked in. How about the, um, the company itself? Did the workplace culture change over that time, and how so? Wow. Um, I was always impressed by Corning. Um, that it was, it seemed to be quite concerned about the employee mm -hmm. and about the, you know, were you, were you happy in your work? Now this did vary from division to division and department to department. Right. But um, most of the time, I, um, I was in a, a, a very congenial situation. Mm -hmm. um, 
And um, yeah, there were some tough days and uh, other, other things, but, but basically it was a very congenial company to work for and I, I, I felt very lucky. At one time I heard a consultant say that, that Corning was such a polite company. <laughs> uh, there, it was really to their detriment that they didn't confront each other more. Okay. But I said, well, yeah, but that, that's kind of nice that people are that <laughs> polite. And we did have some people come in from other companies that, were, they, that was a culture shock for them that they couldn't yell and scream at somebody else. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> so very quickly they, 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 they learned that you have to be a gentleman in Corning. At least right. that's, that was the company I saw. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like the ape line men and the elephant. I'm sure you're getting different right. responses to that <laughs> question, but I saw a very congenial company. Uh-huh, great. So um, you mentioned now uh, how working for yourself was a little bit different. So when you were um, designing uh, in the, just in the consumer products division, correct? Or did you design yeah, outside no, of? No, just, just consumer okay. products and then corporate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you would get projects. Now, how would you work on multiple projects at a time? Yes. How often would you get a project? Yeah. You might work on two or three at a time, okay. depending upon what was needed. Um, and uh, sometimes you were in the early phases, the sketching phase. Other times you were in the, the final drawing stages and, okay. and putting it. So that you, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have three projects start all at the same time. Mm -hmm. They would be sequenced so that you'd, you'd be able to um, manage them that way. Okay. And did you work um, in collaboration with other designers, uh, other shape designers, or you would work with someone who had a decoration? Um, in a case where there was a decoration, um, usually the shape would be all done. Okay. And yes, I would be concerned about was there was the flat space on there for a decoration. Right. But uh, I wouldn't. We wouldn't discuss what sort of decoration was going to go on it okay. uh, ahead of time. I would just hand it over as a finished as a as a prototype to them to lay out and design the decoration. So you wouldn't get any input if you didn't like the design or where it was. You wouldn't be able to say anything. The uh, the decoration? No, right. that was the consumer would decide what they oh, liked. See, we would test we would test various decorations. So that was another. Thing. I mean, the decoration designer sometimes <laughs> would pull your hair out <laughs> because the consumers didn't pick the right design. But, right. Uh, that's just it. And you, you never put anything into market research that you didn't like yourself. Okay. Because you're almost guaranteed the consumers don't pick it. Right. So, <laughs> so you, you, you only put out what you like. So was it a lot of pressure to, you know, get the design just right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there was. I mean, you, you wanted to make something that was going to sell well mm -hmm. and that was going to do well against competition. And so that's why all the market research. Right. And uh, there are some pro some companies, some major companies that don't do a lot of market research. On various, hmm. I think, um, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I think Rubbermaid is one okay. was was or is one of those companies. They have a series of designers and very knowledgeable people. They design it, they make a mold, you know, mm -hmm. they mold, they put it into production, and if it sells great, if it doesn't sell, I think they pull it back and just you know okay. that didn't work. With uh, Corning, I think our tooling is much more expensive, mm -hmm. and it's much more complicated to manufacture our products. So we wanted to make pretty sure that it was going to go well right. beforehand. So that's why we would mar do a lot of market testing with prototypes and models ahead of time to know uh, that it was going to do well in the marketplace. Okay. So and as a designer, did you really have to have a good handle on what your competitors were producing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we would uh, we would go out to, to stores um, mm -hmm. and look. We would uh, every year we'd go out to the housewares show in Chicago where all of the housewares manufacturers are on display, and you'd go around to their booths and see what they were doing, and they would, would they go around to your booth and <laughs> see what you were doing. <laughs> would they know who you were? Would they be like, oh, um, that's well, they could, they could pretty much spot because I didn't have an order book in my hand, right. so. I, <laughs> And I wouldn't ask the right questions as a, as a potential right. customer. <laughs> I'd be asking them as a designer. So, yeah, it was. Uh, but that was that was part of the game. Mm -hmm. So now I'm curious um, for consumer products. You mentioned that you did shapes. Mm -hmm. Were there certain shapes that would work well or not well with a, a product that you would use to cook? Or I'm just curious how that works. Well, yes. I mean, there are. Um, there would be shapes that wouldn't work. But the the cookware have been the cookware has evolved through the centuries. So right. they're, they're, I mean, you know what a saucepan looks like. You know what a skillet looks like. Uh, you know what a, a baking dish looks like. Mm -hmm. The question, the the areas that you work with is like on a baking dish. You know the radius of the corners because um, you want it to be easy to form. Mm -hmm. You want it to be um, easy to clean. You don't yes. want them to be tight corners so you can't get in there. 
But on the other hand, you also don't want to have a cake that's that's round. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's round. You know, it's sort of a lump. You want to have a cake that's rectangular in a, in a right. rectangular baking dish. So, um, and then there would be the handles. You could design mm -hmm. the handles so that they would be a little bit easier to grip. And not only just gripping, but um, and this was one of our problems was we had very often grip them with our hands and say they're nice, but no, you grip them with potholders. Right. You grip them in soapy water, and so you have to really t into, take into adjustment how you're going to handle it uh, in order to design the handles that make sense for the actual use. Mm -hmm. And would, it, um, would the products differ between whether it was the clear Pyrex glass or whether it was um, a different kind of oh, glass? Opal. Yeah, opal. Opal glass would be the... Um, um, and a, no, in fact, very. I think the molds were almost interchangeable, so you could okay. make a product both in clear and in opal. Uh, Corningware did, um, was different. I mean, mm -hmm. It was a different material, um, but a lot of the basic principles of glass forming and, and handle okay. design and everything else were the same. Okay. So it was a matter of, st and at that point, it would become a matter of styling. Mm -hmm. the, the Corningware handle was a very um, uh, identifiable signal to people. I mean, the, the Corningware right. had these two handles on either side. And um, you never found Corningware handles on a Pyrex piece or Pyrex handles on a Corning piece. Right. Interesting. So you mentioned the test kitchen, and I'm really interested uh, by the test kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, and how it was used. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about sure. what you did there? Well, the test, I didn't do the test right, kitchen, right. but I, um, we worked a lot with the test kitchens because they would take our prototypes or, um, well, first of all, as we're designing, we would talk to the test kitchen about how this product is used. Mm -hmm. What is it used for? what sort of foods are found in it, uh, how do people clean it, you know, they would give us sort of the preliminary consumer guidance as to what, mm -hmm. what the product was all about. So we'd sketch, we'd do some prototypes, um, we would, um, sometimes we took the plaster or, or wooden models into the test kitchen and got feedback from them, but as soon as we got something with, made of glass or glass ceramics, uh, maybe a, a production, a, a trial run or something like that, mm -hmm. we'd put that into the test kitchen and they would actually use it. Mm -hmm. And they would cook and they would they would try various foods. They had sort of a standard array of foods they'd try. They would try bacon there, try pancakes. Pancakes, by the way, is how you test the heat distribution oh. in a thing. You, put, you okay. do a pancake on there and then when it's not quite done, you, you flip it over and find out where is it right. burned and where is it, had, where is it uh -huh. cooked and where is it not <laughs> cooked. So that's a nice way of studying heaters, especially in the microwave. They put pancake batter in there and see where it, with huh. the, the pattern of microwave in the microwave. Um, so you'd have these, the products, the uh, prototypes that you had made up, uh, they would run them through a series of tests and um, give you feedback as to what seemed to be working and what wasn't working. Mm -hmm. um, and um, even, again, their cleaning was a big thing about you know, whether it was easy to clean. So in their, when they would wash it, they would tell us whether it was right. easy to get the, the dirt out of the cracks and crevices and things like that. Huh. And um, uh, they, it, it, the test kitchen, even though I know for, for Neil O'Donnell, who was the, um, oh, what would you call him? The chef uh, for the division, but he was right. also a PR person for Cornelius the division. Cornelius for Corning. Cornelius, yeah. <laughs> Corn, yeah. And um, they, uh, he put out a couple of cookbooks, and they had to do all the confirming of the recipes that he had mm -hmm. dug up or that he developed himself. They confirmed them. In the t they followed the recipes and saw what actually happened. Mm -hmm. So they tested the recipes to make sure they were doable. Okay. Um, and uh, not just doable by a chef, but right. doable by real people. So. Right. So were the people that worked in the test kitchen, were they kind of just average people that would come in, or were they employees that were always there uh, testing they were Well, there was a standard um, staff, uh, mostly home economists. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then you had also people who would come in to help out at times when there was more, uh, more heavy load. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had something that was interesting, was a uh, uh, consumer test panel in the Corning area, Stu Ben and, and okay. Chemung County, we had something like 1,500 households and homemakers wow. who would um, take prototype products that we were considering and uh, take them into their home and just use them every day mm -hmm. for a, a month or so. And then we would debrief them as to what they found, uh, what they liked and didn't like about it. And they, surprisingly enough, as loyal as they were to Corning, their loyalty meant they were also very candid right. in their response. If they didn't like something or if something wasn't working, they'd tell us. And we would thank them mm. profusely for that because that, tell, tell us now. Don't tell us after we've right. made 100 million of them or something like that. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So we had, 
again, this, this whole, the market testing, the consumer uh, panel, I guess mm -hmm. we call it the consumer panel, the test kitchen, was all trying to make sure that we, when we came out with a product, we knew what right. it was going to do. Right. And how well it was going to perform. And would there be kind of a standard um, testing period, like from when you were done with the product and it went through any other kind of design elements and it was kind of set to be mm -hmm. tested, was there a, a, a length of time that they would test the product before it would be released and put into production? It depended upon the product, I think. It sometimes, it, yeah, there was, it was quite a long time uh, mm -hmm. to bef before, they, they, depending, I can't think of an example at the moment, but certain products would take a longer time to develop problems if they mm -hmm. were going to develop. Like uh, one of them was, well, we, we did accelerating testing, like on decorations in the dishwasher. Ah. How, how durable were decorations in the dishwasher? <laughs> and um, um, that, you just run it in the dishwasher 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do it very quickly. You could do five years worth of dishwashing in, in right. like a week. Oh, and geez. you knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and that was another, th another new thing with the... Um, uh, enamel that was on the mm. measuring cup that I designed, it was a much more durable um, okay. enamel and it could go through many more dishwashings. Than, uh, and also because of the durability, you could print solid lettering. You'll notice okay. on, the, on the older measuring cups, uh, it was all outline lettering mm. and very thin lines and very thin numbers. Uh, on the newer cups, they can get thicker because of the change in the enamel. Huh. And that was that came from what they called um, coating technologies or decorate. Yeah, coating technology was the name of the department, um, and they worked mostly on Corel and, and Pyrex and, and Corningware, um, because Corel, of course, sees a lot of the dishwasher too. So right. they may, had to make sure that the Corel decorations stayed on there for a long time. Huh. Interesting. So. Um of course, the Pyrex measuring cup is a biggie. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the other products that you worked on or, or you know, led the design for that you, you feel uh, really proud of having done? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think the, the work that I did with the small appliance line, which mm -hmm. I did in the early 70s, um, was very um, gratifying in terms of being able to design. We, we did uh, two or three percolators, or, or two sizes of percolators with four different decorations. Okay. And so there were four models there. Uh, I designed a toaster, which was worked off of radiant heat uh, through, um, there were two glass tubes in mm -hmm. it with a heating element in the glass tubes. Oh. And the, the, that glass, I forget the name, was it Vicor or something? It was very okay. high temperature glass that could take the heat of the, kind of the cow rods. Um, and I designed, it, it was sort of a triangular one. Um, with two slab sides of, of pyroceram, and then the ends were a yellow plastic. Mm -hmm. um, that, I, I really liked that, but again, it never went to market. Oh. <laughs> so, Did you at um, least get to keep one of your test copies? Um, I didn't, no, oh. I didn't. I do, have, I, I do have the photographs of it in oh. my portfolio, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then there were, I forget all the little ones that I did. I, I, um, I think I redesigned... Um, some of the baking dishes, those, like the square mm. baking dish, I, mm -hmm. I made the handles roll a little. They just came out straight, and I just made them roll a little bit so they were easier to hold on to. Um, boy, I, I, I really, um, I haven't thought too much about all <laughs> the things I designed in all those years. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was Pyrex. There was some Corningware, and mm. the Corningware, I don't think, I don't, again, the Corningware, I think, was just sort of a refinement on something else that had been done, so I, I don't think there are any corning pieces that I did. So is that something that you often got, instead of designing a, a completely new product, mm -hmm. you just kind of be refining a yes, little Yes, just tweak it. Yeah. Okay. Again, because cookware, a lot of the cookware designs are classic. Mm -hmm. so. One of the things I do remember was uh, we used to design uh, accessories oh. for Pyrex. These would be, it would be a, a metal holder for mm -hmm. a Pyrex casserole. And the, um, the holder would be a lithographed metal decoration so it'd be a very elaborate printing huh. God, it was such a relief to, you know from all the very restrictive printing we could do on glass <laughs> we could do you know we could print a photograph on this right. metal and i worked for a um i work with a uh, supply house out in um, ohio called balanoff uh, they made some very decorative they were making uh, canisters um, um flour sets you okay. know flour sugar yeah. coffee and stuff and um so we asked them if they could make these holders for products, and they said yes, they could. And I went out and I spent a lot of time because uh, we had a very beautiful—I um, think it's like tool work, 
decoration, which okay. is hand painted. Well, the, the the original art was hand painted, and then we reproduced it in uh, photographically, mm -hmm. color separated it. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you, know, you color separate it and then put all the colors back together again, and that's the finished okay. print. Um, and so they would they would on this huge machine that would run sheets of metal through the machine, they would print all the blue and all the red and all the yellow and all the huh. black. <laughs> and when it comes out the other end, it's a, it's a completely finished, beautiful artwork. Right. But all of those colors had to be spot on. Everything had to be registered correctly so it was lined up. And the density had to be just right. So I, I would go out to the plant when they were starting up production. And, mm -hmm. and I'd have the original artwork here. And I'd hold a piece of metal, printed metal there, look at them and say, yes, this is close enough, or no, it isn't close enough. Right. So that's. Um, that was another project that I worked on, and, and I did. I think I did three different versions of that, three different decorations. So, did you? Um, was that a fairly regular thing that you worked with materials That's, other than glass? Um, yes, plastic, glass. Uh, okay. We spent a lot of time designing plastics, huh. um, and um, it's quite different. Uh, some of the principles are the same, but you can do a lot more with plastic than you mm -hmm. can with glass, um, and. Um, when I talk about the decorations on this, the decoration designer was a consultant designer up in Albany. So okay. I, I was working with her, her artwork. That's why I'm, I'm still a shape designer. <laughs> <laughs> so. so what kind of things did you do in plastic? Well, mostly they were handles for, or okay. like um, the, um, the 1210 percolator mm. had, a, um, had a metal, it was a, a long, narrow, blown, um, a uh, pyrocerame bowl, mm -hmm. or you know, a bowl, and then the top was a stainless steel top uh, with a pouring lip on it, and that was held onto the bowl by epoxy. Okay. And then there was attached to that was this uh, phenolic handle, mm -hmm. and that handle had within it the electronics uh, to go okay. into the because the electronics had to go over the top and into the pot. Right. <laughs> they couldn't come up through the bottom, right. so. Um, um, the design of that the, of the plastic handle with the plug and the top and the thermostat and the wires and the <laughs> little lights and everything it all had to go uh -huh. had had to, all had to fit together and then look good you know, right <laughs> <That's> <laughs> at complex. the end yeah um, but it all fit together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, that was a fun project and actually that product went to market for quite a few years uh, that was very well received right. um, and um, yeah. So that's, that was one of the plastic parts. I, I think there may have been some other plastic holders that I worked on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so um, during your time in the design department, I, I think you moved up from kind of a, I don't know if it was a beginner designer um, to a senior? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think I came in as a senior designer and then moved up to a design supervisor. OK, yeah. Uh, and then went into a um, little bit more pro product development because I was working with engineering and manufacturing mm -hmm. and, and some design. Um, and then my first job in, in marketing was actually a liaison between Sullivan Park, the research okay. group we have, and uh, consumer division, uh, where it's, um, the idea was to make uh, Corel, but make it thinner mm -hmm. and make it um, almost like a, a, a glass paper plate. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> and. Um, because they could get, cut the price down because the right. material would be less and all of that. So they, they d and up at uh, Sullivan Park, they actually made some products out of this. This was a fascinating research thing. I, I, um, so I was working with them about that. And um, we took these very thin Corel products out to the, mark, uh, to the uh, focus groups. And they, they looked at it and they said, wow, this is great. It's absolutely rigid. You could cut on it. You can carry it without it having it bend over. It's really an improvement on paper plates. And it's really so good. And in fact, it's so good, I think I would wash it and use it again. <laughs> and then after about 45 minutes of discussion group, they would say, and then I would put it in the cabinet, and it would be like a regular. <laughs> and so it's really, no, I don't like the idea at all. <laughs> and it was fascinating to watch. And it happened in every single group we did. They would love the idea originally right. as, a, as a replacement for paper plates. They could use it multiple times, but then they realized they'd have to store it, <laughs> and it would be just like the dinnerware they have in their cabinets right. anyhow. So it went out the window and stopped right there. <laughs> I've never heard of those plates. That is no, it never went to market. <laughs> so could you, uh, this might be difficult, but could you give me a uh, kind of idea percentage or 
or something, rough idea of how many products that you worked on that didn't end up going to market or went to market and you know didn't do so well and how many did go to market and were in production. Is that something you could really estimate? Not really. Okay. Um, I, 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 I know that the percolator went to market and did mm -hmm. very well. Uh, the measuring cup went to market and did well. The, the uh, square cake dish that I worked on, and I think I, there was a loaf dish in there too, uh, that went to market and, and um, probably lasted 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, because of the testing, most of the products I worked, if the, if the project wasn't canceled ahead of time, mm -hmm. any product that went to market succeeded. It, okay. it, you know, it, was, it was successful by definition. Right, <laughs> right. Because we tested the dickens out of it. And, um, um, but some of them just lasted longer than others. Right. And uh, like the measuring cup has lasted now, what, 20, 20 some odd years. Yeah. So. Um, whereas the um, the percolator, well, the percolator went out of production. Mm. They just stopped making it. So, no, I don't have a, a figure as to what <laughs> what percentage it is, but some of them worked and some of them didn't. Right. Well, and um, for the consumer products division, would there be kind of a, um, you know, just a reevaluation process? Like every ten years, you would take a look at the measuring cup and say, is there anything we can tweak, or would it be it's out there, it's doing well, you know? Um, Generally speaking, if it was doing well, um, you wouldn't be asked to redesign it because mm -hmm. if it was doing well, why mess with something that's doing well was the philosophy. And right. also, um, they were always looking for what they called incremental sales, mm -hmm. more sales than before. So if you simply took something and tweaked it a little bit, like, like changing the handles on the right. baking, I don't think we sold that many baking dishes. We just, it was an improvement and we had been getting or, um, letters in from people mm -hmm. saying that the the handles were slippery when you were washing it. Mm -hmm. So by making that improvement, it was an improved product. Didn't really increase sales that much, but it was an improvement. Right. Right. Um, um, I forget your question actually. Oh, <laughs> if, if just if products, if you would reevaluate them every oh few, yes, how many um, years? No, there wasn't a set amount with mm -hmm. that. Uh, when you when you would reevaluate them would be because sales were dropping off, mm. or a new product had come in on the marketplace and we needed to to match it, right? Uh, uh, meet it, you know, compete with it. Uh, that's pretty much what triggered things. Mm -hmm. Now we did have, and I was participating in this a lot. I um, became interested in the the creative process itself. Mm -hmm. Where do these ideas come from, and how do I, you know how do I work? <laughs> what makes me tick? Um, and I found that there was an um, um, outfit up in Buffalo that actually has studied the creative process and has, oh. uh, has seminars every summer for teaching the creative process. They've broken it down into an actually five-step process with <laughs> steps in between, all that. And I went up there and I was trained as a facilitator for running uh, idea sessions uh -huh. and uh, coming up with new ideas. So that was another thing I was doing. As I was a designer, I was okay. also... Uh, facilitating these idea sessions with people to come up with new ideas for either new decorations or new products or, or new approaches to things, huh. and um, that was that was fun, for a while. It got a little bit <laughs> tedious after a while, but <laughs> um, that was a, ne a different dimension to my job. And that's that's actually where I began to grow out of being a designer. Mm. So um, when you were more of a in a supervisory role in the mm -hmm. department, were you still actively designing, or were you more yes. supervising what everyone yes. else was doing? Yes. No, I was. I was. Uh, I'm still a senior designer. What I supervised was the, um, well, let's see, the decoration designers. They would do the original art mm -hmm. for one piece. They would hand that off to a, um, um, a graphic detailer is what they call, okay. and that person would take that design, and um, adjust it so that it fit all the different, for the cups and the saucers and the 10 inch plate and the eight inch plate and the salad bowl and all that. You know, <laughs> and they would, they would do that and they would, they would um, do that. So I, I had the uh, graphic detailers mm -hmm. report to me and also the model shop, which at that time had two full-time employees okay. reported to me. Um, that's where I was a design supervisor. I wasn't the manager of the department. I just supervised mm -hmm. um, the sort of the, um, assistant people, the okay. people that would assist us in doing our job. Right. Oh. Well, do you have any other sort of topics that you want to talk about, <laughs> about your time in Corning or the work that you've done? Um, no, we've talked, actually, we've, we've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, yeah. One of the 
things that I feel very good about with Corning, you talk about the culture of the company. Mm -hmm. Fairly early on as a designer, I went out to see a couple of focus groups and I became really intrigued with the process of how in, through conversation you could mm -hmm. bring out information from people. And um, I, I asked the um, then manager of market research if I could actually conduct some focus groups. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, had, I had observed a lot, and I had observed some very good focus group moderators, uh, so that I, when I started out, um, it was on a very, it was on a little teapot mm -hmm. that someone, one of my rules of thumb was I didn't ever test, I didn't ever conduct focus groups on my own products. Right. Except for the measuring cup. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that just happened by cir circumstance uh -huh. that I was involved in that. But anyhow, so my first thing was a, was a tea, little teapot tea kettle, actually. Tea mm -hmm. kettle. It was larger than a tea. A teapot is what you brew the tea in. A tea kettle is okay. what you boil water in. Okay. And um, so we went down. It was to Roosevelt Field on Long Island. Is that where that is? There's a research um, place in there. We sat down and I went into the other room and the consumers came in and I introduced myself and I said, we're going to talk about tea kettles today. And one of the women said, tea kettles? I don't want to talk about tea kettles. <laughs> and she got up and she left. <laughs> that was my very first group, oh, and I, no. I could have just dissolved there, but I didn't. I said, well, all right, we found out she doesn't like tea kettles, let's go right. on. So we just, we went on after that. But um, <laughs> that, was, um, that was my first experience with doing my own focus right. groups. <laughs> oh my gosh, and that's a whole other kind of skill set, you know, just yeah. dealing with people. Just, yeah, just talking <laughs> and talking with people. Because in a focus group, you, you don't ask, you ask open-ended questions right. and you let them fill in all the answers and you're very careful not to ask leading questions you're mm -hmm. like how much do you like this hmm. you know how do you feel about this is mm -hmm. the way you ask the question you know what is your response to this uh, you don't say how much do you like it <laughs> <laughs> so was it interesting then um, having designed a lot of pieces and then coming in and testing other people's you know work mm -hmm. um, was it interesting to see uh, that sort side of the process rather than just kind of getting the feedback. Back I, I, I found it very interesting and very uh, rewarding. I enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, and, and I really, um, what you do is you tape record, sometimes videotape uh, the sessions, mostly tape record at that time. And um, you go back and listen to the tapes mm -hmm. and then write a report on what people said. Here was the question and here's what people said and here's what it means. Right. Um, and. Um, because very often what they said wasn't exactly what they meant. Right. And so you had to sort of listen between the lines. And uh, there were some uh, interesting questions that we'd ask. We, uh, when um, we would ask about whether they liked the product, you know, that would be, they would respond one way or the other. Mm. But then you say, where would you store the product? Huh. And where, the, where they stored it really told you how much they liked it. Really? That was the answer. The, the, other, the other stuff, they were maybe being polite. Right. But they, when you asked them where they stored it, they, and it, like um, uh, one product, well, I'd store it right out on the counter because I'd use it every day. Mm -hmm. That would be a wonderful answer. I would store it in the upper cabinet, okay. Lower <laughs> cabinet, not so good. Out in the pantry, even <laughs> on the cellar stairs, one person <laughs> said to me, on the cellar stairs, that's the kiss of death. <laughs> oh, so, no. Yeah. Another question was, um, uh, would you give this as a gift? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Who would you give it to? <laughs> well, it's dangerous. the various high, yeah, yeah, you can see the family <laughs> politics there. I'd give it to my mother-in-law. Well, mm -hmm. that's very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good because, if you, but I'd give it to my daughter in college was the was the kiss of death one because really? they, yeah, you form yeah. everything off to your daughter in college. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there were various. You'd ask certain questions and and. They were sort of disguised questions like that one. You know, who would you give it to was another one to find out whether they really liked it or not. That's real. I would never, never even think about that as an <laughs> indicator of how they liked the product. But that's very true. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because if you ask them straight out, what do you think of this? They'll, the tendency would be to poli be, be polite. I mean, right. they know that the, the client is behind the one-way right. mirror because we told them that. We had to tell them that. And so um, there was always that element of politeness that you had to overcome, and you overcome right. it. You overcame it by asking questions that they were disarmed with. Did you ever have a very out of control, angry focus group you had to deal with? Um, I had one uh, <laughs> exactly had to do with cutlery. We oh. we, we were talking about cut. We did um, we did yeah knives uh, forks <laughs> and and not for, but it was knives carving knives and. Um, 
we were, we had, oh, I know what it was. We had sold a number of them out in the Seattle area in the test market, and we had kept track of who bought them. So we contacted those people and asked them to come in and talk to us about what they liked and didn't like about it. Um, and I was the moderator with mm -hmm. those discussions. So um, the women would come in and spend about 15 or 20 minutes talking, that'd be fine. Well, this one woman came in with a husband who would not leave her alone. And he demanded that he sit in on the discussion. So we got out in the room, I introduced myself, and I said, and we're taping the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he went ballistic. He said, you know, taping? What are you doing? I don't want this recorded. Da, 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 you know. And I finally got him calmed down to the point where I could ask his wife some questions. I didn't tell him <laughs> that we were videotaping, right. not just audio <laughs> tape. We were videotaping. So, But uh, the videotapes, you know, never went anywhere. They didn't, right. they didn't show up on the, um, on the TV news or anything right. like that. They were just internal. But if I had told him we were videotaping, I think that would have been the end of it. I wonder so. why he was so... Uh... Uh, he was just, he was very... Protective of his wife, mm. and, and you know he didn't want to um, didn't want to commit to anything, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> or commit, have his wife commit to anything. So, mm -hmm. so now I'm curious for the test kitchen and uh, the focus groups, any kind of testing that you did with consumers, mm -hmm. was that mostly women, or was it a mixture of women and men? Did that change over it, de the with, decades? With the cookware, it was primarily women. Um, I'm. I don't think we did any work with men and cookware. Um, hmm. That just wasn't wasn't relevant at the time. Um, with some of the other products that I tested for when I w became a consultant in, in corporate marketing, mm -hmm. yeah, those like the lab workers. A lot of the lab people were were men, right? And so we did work with men there, uh, men and women. Um, and um, trying to think of some of the other well, the, the um, fiber optic groups were mm -hmm. all men. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all technicians, electrical, um, the fiber optic technicians. Right. Um, but uh, consumers, almost all women, they were homemakers, mm -hmm. and um, that was one of the criteria. We screened, we screened, we could specify who we wanted to talk to. Okay. Women between this age and that age, women who had bought this in the last six months, women who did this or did that, mm -hmm. um, and in some cases it would be professional women, people who worked outside mm -hmm. of the home then we would talk with them. And it would be interesting to do them like back to back. You'd do a, a group of homemakers who, who that was their only job. Right. And then women who worked outside the home and, and also managed the home, um, how they felt about it. And you could hear the contrast, right, between huh. the two groups. Interesting. Now, would you, um, you said you could test certain age ranges as well. Did mm -hmm. you test certain age ranges for different products? Um, yes. <laughs> um, the lighter Corel, mm -hmm. we tested because it was so light, we thought that that would go well with an older older set. So mm -hmm. that if they had a stack of 12, it wouldn't be so heavy they couldn't lift right. it up. Uh, so we did test uh, down in Florida for uh, huh. older people uh, down there. Okay. And um, so sometimes we did test mm -hmm. for, you know, for um, older, um, older folks. Would you also do tests with, you know, an older group and a younger group and then compare those answers, just like you would do homemakers? In, cer in certain things, yes, you would. Okay. Um, yeah, you would. Um, see, the, one of the principles in marketing is you go after the people who are in their acquisitive period, which is mm -hmm. was 25 to 35. That's when they're building, you know, they're buying their first house, they're equipping right. their first house. That's the major time that they're going to buy things. Then what happens is they keep them for 20 or 30 years and then usually when the kids move out of the house, they replace their stuff. So there's yeah. a second surge up in the 50s and early 60s that they, you know, like for drinkware and for, for tableware, right. they might go out and buy their own set, like the set they've always wanted. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, and, and, and drinkware, by the time the kids are out of the house, they don't have through two cups that match or two, right. two glasses that match. <laughs> so they go out and buy a whole set that look the same. Mm -hmm. So there is that second, uh, huh. that second uh, group of people. Interesting. Now, I'm curious, the, again, this is the, the focus group kind of area. Mm -hmm. Would certain designs resonate with different groups of people? Would that be a big factor in whether they liked the piece or not? Or would it just be more functional, you know, this works, I don't care what it looks like? Would certain designs resonate with? Would, would people um, not like the product if they didn't like the decoration? Sorry, I meant decoration, not design. Okay, um, um, yeah, oh yes. If the decoration wasn't right, 
um, you know, they didn't like those flowers. Right. Or they had a bad memory about those flowers. You know, they, <laughs> my boyfriend getting there, he broke up with me. But, um, yeah, they would, they would react that way sometimes. Huh. Um, and um, uh, and they would, they would, that could turn them away from the whole design. But then mm. that would be the moderator's job to come back and say, well, if you can discount the flowers that you don't like, right. what do you think of it? Well, the way you do that is you get ahead of that game and you show it without any decoration. Mm -hmm. You get them to respond to the product without decoration. Mm -hmm. They like the handle. They like the shape. It looks like it'll work. Then, then you decorate it. You, you bring out the decorated ones and you talk about the, just right. the decorations. Okay. So you separate, you know, you, you, you get ahead as I right. say. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it neutral before you bring yeah, in decorations. Right. So now, as a designer of shapes, did you have anything to do with the color of the product that was coming out? Like this, if it was a solid color? Well, um, in uh, the um, Fireside Pyrex, mm -hmm. I developed that color. Oh, um, okay. For the, for, yeah. Uh, along with the model shop, we had a, a spray booth and, and paint system, which was about the size of the area of the room we're in now, mm -hmm. uh, with various cans of basic colors mm -hmm. and then a mixing system so you could mix any color paint uh, opaque or transparent you oh, could have cool. textured you could have it sparkled you could you know, all <laughs> it was, it, actually it was based on an, a body shop mm -hmm. an automotive body shop uh, huh. system <clears throat> and so that um, the idea came out to have a tinted pyrex and I'm not too sure where that came from I know that oh um, I think anchor hawking came out <laughs> there and what they used was the easiest color to make, which was beer bottle brown. Mm -hmm. It was a very warm yellowy brown, or brownish yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to come up with a similar color, a brown color, but not look like theirs. Right. So I went more to the, if, you, if you'll go with me, or bear with me, a, a bluish brown. Okay. A, a, yeah. not, a, not a warm brown, but a cool brown. Mm -hmm. And um, I mixed, um, mixed up various colors, uh, transparent lacquers, and sprayed it on the Pyrex and then tested various shades of that and various variations of that and eventually we came up with the, the color that became Fireside and um, it was interesting because what Sullivan Park was working with us on that in terms of developing the colorants that actually mm -hmm. would color the glass and one of the scientists turned to me and said you know for the last 50 years we've been trying to make clear glass we've never we've never tried to make colored glass before <laughs> he said this is really new to us and um, uh, the color that I picked with the blue element in there was actually very difficult to make mm -hmm. and very difficult to maintain it uh, from run to run and okay. batch to batch. Um, but it, we were able, once we got it stabilized, it, it worked very well. Um, but the beer bottle brown, they said they could have done that overnight, but the, the color that I picked, it took them weeks <laughs> to do. <laughs> That's great. So did you, now, when you were designing products, mm -hmm. did you use certain colors with certain pieces? Colors of glass? Right, um, yes. No, I think Fireside pretty much, well, we will use the only other color glass we did. Okay. Um, we, um, and that went across the whole line. We made okay. everything in that, because once you have a big, you know, zillion ton tank of glass <laughs> melted, you're going to make as many products as you can with different variations on right. it. Right. So. And you don't change that tank color very easily mm -hmm. because you, I, I don't know if they have to throw the uh, the lining of the tank away or something oh. like that when they do it. Right. Because you'd be making paley, pale brown glass for months <laughs> <laughs> after that. So, uh, no, I think that... Um, that could be your, your range of products, the color spectrum yeah, of right. browns. Well, and, <laughs> no, that's, you, know, you want consistency <laughs> when you're manufacturing. You don't want inconsistency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh, that's really neat. All right. Well, do you have anything else that you would want to talk about? Yeah, well, we've, um, I think we've covered more than I thought we were going yeah. to today. That's great. <laughs> and um, no, we've talked about the, my, myself as a designer, mm -hmm. uh, then as a, as a marketer and market researcher, um, and all the different designs, or many of the designs I worked on, and the, the aspects of that. So I think we pretty well covered it. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking with me. It's been really interesting um, to hear about the design process. I haven't heard about that from someone <laughs> before. So thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome.